Perfect. Now I have your number. Thanks. Hey, I'm Robbie Kramer. You're listening to the Leverage Podcast, where we discuss using your social skills to hack dating, travel, finding your dream job, and becoming a complete man. So you guys hear me talk a lot on this podcast about how when you take a risk and do the things you love in life, follow your passions, things tend to work out. And I was sitting on the beach in Mexico a couple months ago, just kind of chilling and avoiding the uh, mundane sort of lifestyle that most U.S. cities uh, are currently experiencing with the closures and the pandemic and uh, bumped into a dude. Um, We uh, exchanged a few emails. He found out I had this podcast messaged me that he was a sex blogger and writer for Vice Magazine, Men's Health, Men's Journal. And he was like, wow, man, I I found your podcast. I'm really interested. And this is what I do. And I can't tell you how often I meet cool, interesting people due to the fact that I was able to basically say fuck you to the nine to five and took a risk and started this podcast in my dating coaching business. And I have a guest on here, the guy I met on the beach who did the same. Um, He essentially started doing crazy stuff and following his passions and his sexuality, um, turned that into, you know, pieces of literature and content and now hangs out on the beach as well. And uh, that guy is uh, Grant Stoddard uh, writing. uh, And he's like I said, he's appeared on Men's Health, Men's Journal, New York Magazine, Glamour, New York Times. Vice, Playboy, BBC, among others. Uh, He's the author of a memoir entitled Working Stiff, The Misadventures of an Accidental Sexpert, and co-author of Sex Guide, Great in Bed, with Dr. Debbie Hebernick of Kinsey Institute. Uh, I've gone through a ton of his articles on men's health, and, uh, you know, we share a lot of the same crazy sort of sexual adventures and appetite for that. So a lot of of, uh, interesting... (laughs) topics we'll hope to explore on this podcast so welcome grant hey robbie what's going on good to have you back good to have you on here man yeah so i mean you've got a crazy story um why don't you kind of start from the beginning and lead us into you know how you how you went on this journey of sex and adventure and turned it into a passion and career or turned into a career it was a passion i should say yeah i mean um you know, I'll try and boil this down as much as I can. I was a loser in high school Mm -hmm. and um, I grew up in a town where nobody ever really left. Um, Only a very small minority of people actually went on to higher education. And, um, And I ended up being one of them for some reason. I was certainly not one of the more academically gifted people in the class and um you know um i ended up um following a girl to new jersey from england where i'm from and um and then my world started to change i took this big leap of faith and i ended up getting uh, a record deal as i was a musician and a visa so i could stay in the country legally and, um, and, and all these um, fascinating opportunities presented themselves mostly because I think I have an accent and people, <laughs> people are prepared to give uh, people a lot of leeway if, they, if they've got an English accent, I think, you know. So um, it, was a nice, um, it was a nice leg up, completely undeserved, um, but, but I certainly took advantage of it. And, um, and, you know, I, as I, well, I mean, just, just to interrupt, you know, it, it kind of, it, it's undeserved in the fact that like, it's just your accent. It's just how you talk, but yeah. you took the risk and you came to the U S and, you know, in, in obviously in England, you don't have an accent, but here you're, you're unique. And I had the same experience when I moved abroad to Ukraine, all of a sudden, anyone I met was interested in me just due to the fact that I was, you know, American or not from there. 
So just a, a simple thing like moving, <laughs> which takes, it's a big risk, not, not yeah. necessarily simple, can have a huge impact. So Absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, it's just that little bit of something that's different about you is intriguing enough to a certain subset of people and, um, and they're more willing to give you a break as a result, yeah. you know, um, yeah. wh- whether that be girls or employers or wh- whatever it might be, you know? Um, so yeah, it's very interesting. You know, no one, no one can be a prophet in their own land, they say, you know, so, right. <laughs> so, so moving somewhere different can be a game changer and often is, you know, mm-hmm. um, and it was for me. Um, and um, while I was there, I was, I realized that um, talking of women, that um, people were suddenly, you know, they were more open to what I had to say, more interested in what I had to say, and and more flirtatious than they'd ever been back at home. So, you know, I ended up um, sort of realizing that I could maybe have the sort of dating life that I'd always dreamed of in this new world you know Mm -hmm. um where i I could meet and date and not feel like i was physically repulsing the women around me which is how i'd always felt growing up um so um you know um but but i'll I'll speed this up as much as i can i i kind of fell on hard times i the record company folded i broke up with my girlfriend i found myself like homeless and um without a legit um work visa and Mm -hmm. um, jobless. And um, so it it looked like I was going to have to go home um, after I'd found this wonderful world where people um, seemed to be open to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So so I was very sad about leaving and sort of clung on for dear life for as long as I could. While I was clinging on, somebody told me about a trivia competition that a woman was having and the first prize, if you won this trivia competition, was you got to have sex with her. The winner got to have sex with her, right? Hey, um, hold on a second. Like, to get wind of something like that, you know, that's not like a normal... <laughs> how'd you hear about that in the first place? Was well, it due to... Because that, that's, that's hilarious and awesome. Um, it is. And such a random <laughs> thing to be invited to. So I feel like you have to have some sort of you know, foot in or shoe in to, to something around those lines, right? Yeah, kind of. What it was, was um, this woman, her name is Lisa Carver, and she's a famous cult writer, you know, she, and mm. she, she wrote a column um, on this website called nerve.com. And it was basically all about her sex life, which was interesting and bizarre and thoughtful and strange and brave. And um, she'd recently gotten married. And as a result, her sex column had gotten a little more pedestrian. So she said, you know what? I'm going to do something wild. I'm going to have a, I'm going to randomize the the next person I sleep with in a strange way. And then I'm going to write about the experience and it will be on nerve.com. Now I happen to know this, this um, young woman who was a fan of her writing. And she said, Hey, Lisa Carver's having this trivia competition in a chat room and she's going to fuck the winner. And, so and I was like, I was like, well, why are you telling me? And she's like, well, you know, you're good at trivia and you're basically about to be deported. So why not go home with a funny story? You yeah. know? And I was like, she's got a point. Maybe I should. So <laughs> I ended this competition. I won because I, Maybe not so much now, but I, you know, I was a demon at trivia. In fact, I was on the school quiz team when I was in high school, which is probably one of the reasons I never got late because I was a total. I was just about to say, I've never heard of trivia ever getting anyone laid, but now we found the exception. <laughs> exactly. It's the exception. And so, um, so I won this competition and um, the next step was to get a bus ticket to New Hampshire where she lived right? Mm. I had to borrow the $50 for the bus ticket because I had no money, right? That's how broke I was. Mm -hmm. So I get up there and this 
whole crazy night ensued and it turns out it wasn't just her it was also her husband this porn performer and this limo driver that were all involved there was a hawaiian restaurant involved there was a bowling alley uh, anyway <laughs> the next morning over breakfast she was asking me all about my life because we hadn't really gotten to know each other we kind of got straight down to business yeah and um and I told her, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm about to, you know, I'm penniless, I'm jobless, I don't have a visa, I'm about to leave the country and go back to England. And she's like, well, I know about an opportunity for this internship. It's $5 an hour, $5 an hour. It's three days a week. You have to like grab mail, uh, you know, get fetch coffee. But I don't think they're going to be asking for immigration papers. If that helps you out, I'm happy to put in a good word. So she, she did. Mm -hmm. I went to nerve.com. I interviewed. And within, I think about three months later, I, I hung on for three months living yeah. on um, day old bagels that places were throwing out and sleeping on outside sometimes and sleeping on people's floors and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I got the job, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and kind of, I ingratiate myself with the people there. And, and then, a little while later, Lisa wrote the piece and it was published on Nerve in which she described her whole encounter with me. This, <laughs> I fucked the winner of a trivia competition, you know. Right. And then um, I believe it was Emily Nussbaum, who um, is the TV critic for the New Yorker, I believe, um, now. But back then she was a, an editor at Nerve. She said, are you the guy that Lisa fucked who won the trivia competition. I said, yes. <laughs> and then she said, well, will you do anything for money? And I said, yes. <laughs> and um, so um, she's like, well, would you have sex with somebody on the subway and write about it? And I said, yes. And then I, uh, as immediately after I agreed, I realized I did have no one to have sex with on the subway. So I asked one of my, the fellow interns at the company, I was like, hey, crazy ask. You know, <laughs> I'm not sure you could do this in, in, now, but when we were both 21, I was like, hey, do you, you know, uh, would you would you have sex with me on the A train tonight? And uh, oh. she said, sure. It. She said, sure. So, so we did. And I wrote about it. And I'd never written since high school anything. And... No. <laughs> Another another interruption. Oh, and also one thing, the, your camera is bouncing a lot. I don't know if it's um, the desk you're at or something. No, it's it's. I've got it on a cushion there. See, like I'm going to stop. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. I'm getting oh. excited by my own story, Robin. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. Um, so first of all, the you know, having sex with a random person after winning a trivia contest, I think that would freak a lot of most like normal guys out. Um, it freaked me out. But prior to that, did you have any sort of crazy sexual experiences? Just that one no. girl or a few I, others? I had zero crazy sexual experiences and very few sexual experiences generally. Uh -huh. I had about three or four girlfriends before. They were all long-term girlfriends. Um, I was a late bloomer. So this yeah. was completely out of character. Completely yeah. out. You know, and how did you get the nerve I, to ask the other girl about the age? Because I think, I mean, at least most guys that I work with and who are like me or how I used to be, um, yeah. one of the biggest things that we struggle with was essentially just like being direct and expressing our sexuality in a direct way. Yeah. Um, you know, there's like a, a shame and embarrassment around a girl actually knowing that, you know, we find her attractive. That's what I encounter with a lot of guys who struggle with women. So just, you know, having the nerve to be like, Hey, I'm supposed to write about this thing and I need someone to have sex with on the A train. You want to do it like that? You know, that takes a lot of balls for, um, yeah, you know, for most guys. Was it, was it just because it was such like a, you know, you had to find someone you're kind of under that pressure or was that something you kind of consistently were comfortable doing, but you just didn't take the risk. Totally. No, it was, it, 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 there was some pressure, obviously. Right. You know, I saw that this was an opportunity. And if I seized it, there was an opportunity to 
maybe turn this into a source of income and possibly a visa at some point down the road, you know, which right. was really what I was in most in need of. Right. Um, but also um, between winning the trivia competition and asking my fellow intern, who incidentally ended up becoming my girlfriend, um, <laughs> to have sex with me on the A train, um, I, I'd had several opportunities that had come up and I found that every time I said yes, every time I asked myself, if not now, when, if not me, who, right? Mm -hmm. um, and every time I'd said yes and didn't shy away, things had happened. Like the more you um, seize an opportunity that present, I wasn't like running these opportunities down. They were just turning up and I was just identifying them as opportunities and saying yes to them and seeing where they went. And the more I said yes, the more I was open to, to kind of like weird serendipity and weirdness, the, m the more fantastical things happened. So yeah. in those six months, I'd sort of learned some very valuable lessons, um, which were like, you know, showing up is 99% of it. And, right. and, and like, you know, not to use a hackneyed old thing, uh, hackneyed old phrase, but you know, you miss 100, 100% of the sh shots you never take. Right. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so that, that's, that's what it was. I just became a lot more open um, to saying yes. Okay. Taking those risks. And yeah, I mean, that's, if people just did that, you know, their life would radically change just taking those risks, but most people yeah. don't, you know, so. <laughs> and and on top of that, as you, as you know, Robbie, like it, it's, a, it's also, um, a, a numbers game like when when you think like it, w whatever it is whether it's a work opportunity and stuff you know there's some element of failure is going to be built in and yeah. you might have to get four no's before your fifth yes um and but all, all of those no's are learning experiences in and of themselves right so totally. so so um it, it just um yeah i mean you obviously you're an expert in this you know way more in, about this than i do but it's about kind of kind of quashing down that any initial embarrassment or any self-doubt getting through that awkward phase and then and then coming out the other side and just being you and being open to being liked for being you yeah you know the, the more risks you take the more you experience rejection um and especially if you have either the you know the community uh, or a couple close friends that can help you kind of deal. If some, sometimes the rejection can be brutal, right? And yeah. you might not process it correctly. You might not get through it. But if you have, you know, any sort of halfway decent support system, if you do get a, a rejection, you can reframe that as just a positive. Another, you know, you're just one step closer to a yes. Yeah. You know, you're going to learn so much from those experiences. And eventually good shit's going to happen. You know, like just taking those risks. Like you said, like you're, you're you know, one foot you know, was back already in, in London with your visa about to expire. You're like, yeah, I'll go to this trivia thing. Why not? What do I have to lose? Right. And I think if we all took that approach to life, like, what do I really have to lose? I see a beautiful girl. What do I approach her. What do I have to lose? My, you know, my ego, I'll get a little, you know, butt hurt if she, if she rejects me, who cares? Right. You, you really have nothing to lose. So what, what happened after the, the subway sex and that, and you wrote about that. And I did. And I, I got some help from a friend because I was completely untrained. I, I didn't know anything about writing. I was just, mm -hmm. you know, um, and um, so I got some help from a friend um, who, who um, his best advice was just like, just tell me, like you told me after it happened, like you told me as a friend and then like, let's use that. And then kind of like massage that into something that is, you know, can be, you know, read by a general audience. Mm -hmm. So, so I did that. I took that advice and it, and the editor loved it, published it. It was quite popular. And then from that, we created a series called I did it for science. And the idea was like, I would go off the greenhorn, be sent out and, to experience some weird sex stuff yeah. and then write about it in the form of a, a lab report, you know, so, <laughs> so hypothesis, methodology, apparatus, you know, results, mm -hmm. conclusion, um, which was great because that gave me a sort of like kind of paint by numbers approach to writing. Like I knew all the sections that had to be included. I knew the flow. It was just about plugging in 
the the pieces you know ah that's genius yeah so- I think that's what's missing for i mean i've you know written a bunch of stuff but none of it very good um and that's always been a struggle for me it's like you know there's definitely an art or a science or both obviously of writing and um some people feel like they're good writers some people not but i feel like a lot of people are missing a structure something yeah. they can just kind of follow and um i love the way you d- described you know or that you had that system and that i'm sure made it way easier yeah yeah i mean like it, it it's being a musician first i mean everybody you know a song is usually an intro verse chorus verse chorus midsection double chorus outro mm-hmm. that that's generally how it goes or slight variations on that theme and and what this this uh this kind of like format um gave me the opportunity to sort of develop within these constraints right it was right. super useful so um th- th- you know i did a couple of assignments they, they and then and this was in 2001 um mm-hmm. and then my first like big assignment was i was sent to a porn set in la um but i actually got on that plane to go to los angeles i think like two days after plane started flying after 9 11. Oh, so wow. i was 24 i was too young to rent a car um, right. <laughs> I had to land in la and then i had to get a friend to drive me to chatsworth on Yom Kippur, which he didn't like really <laughs> feel like doing. And um, so, so yeah, it was, it was an interesting uh, thing. And I ended up getting to be um, in the background of a scene of a movie called Hard Evidence 2, uh, which was a porn that was being shot in, in Chatsworth uh, at the time. But it was a fascinating weekend, fascinating weekend. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, what, what was that experience like? like that's like, you know, when I think of porn, I think of, you know, the Valley around circa that sort of time, yeah. you know, porn set, like big cameras, you know, lights, all that stuff, um, which is probably a lot different than how most porn is shot today on uh, OnlyFans or whatever the new thing. Yeah, are. No, <laughs> it, was, it was a big production, you know, there yeah. were lighting people, sound people. I mean, it wasn't... Um, you, you know, there was there was a lot of people on set that I recognized from from porn that I'd seen. You oh. know? Um, so so that was um, really interesting. It was it was interesting to see the sort of um, um, sort of mundanity of it. You know, like um, right. the, 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 the discussions people are having between scenes, really not very sexual, you know. Um, and then, you know, there was a catering that there was a there was. A, there was someone there they called mom who kind of like took care of everyone. She was this older woman. She made, you know, Cajun catfish po' boys for everyone for lunch and stuff. And I don't yeah. know, it was just interesting. Um, but of course, all these people, this was just a couple of weeks after 9-11. So they, they were actually very paranoid that some, some extremist was going to go after the porn industry. Because mm. uh, they were right. like, they hate our freedom, man. What's more free than making porn in California? Like, right. you know, and, then, and then their response to it is a lot of them were, were talking about the sort of guns they were going to purchase to protect themselves and at the studio and stuff. So it was, an, it, was it was interesting. But um, I, I was talking there with a p- porn performer named Kyle Stone, who was um, against using Viagra or any other kind of um, thing that was just coming in. So mm-hmm. that, that meant like, all of us, you know, because prior to Viagra, um, you know, it was very, you kept seeing the same dudes show up in porn again and again and again, because doing what they do is really, really difficult naturally, yeah. right? So, so it's hard the, work, really hard work. Quite literally. Yeah. And, 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 um, and then, and then Viagra came on the scene. Then all of a sudden there were more guys, better looking guys, better, you know, like it wasn't just like Ron Jeremy and people that could, you know, like, yeah manifest a boner like that or ron jeremy was basically ruined by viagra i guess i, I never thought about it I've, I've actually partied with him a few times in my old uh hollywood place he would come over i've got a picture of him lying on the floor wasted with wiley um oh, really? <laughs> yeah. he was my neighbor basically you know yeah. um, this was you know probably five or six years ago really nice guy um but yeah he's you know horrible looking unfortunately yeah um and, and so all of it, you know, but he's, he was kind of his own, 
<laughs> person personality, obviously. Right. Um, right. You know, a legend of porn. Yeah. So yeah, that's fascinating. I never, I never even thought about the fact that Viagra must have replaced a ton of those guys with better looking, you know, stunt dicks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah, young, younger, in shape dudes, and and um, so so. But he was saying like, I I don't know the long term effects of it. You know, like I I I don't know. I don't want to do this. I don't want to become dependent on it. You know, which was interesting because this was only two years after it was released. You know, mm-hmm. uh, or two and a half years after it was released. So that was really interesting. So he was paranoid about that. Everybody else was paranoid about a, a terrorist attack happening on a porn set. Um, and I was just trying to make sense of it all. But yeah. So, so that was it. And then. And so got, they sent you there just to write about what you experienced or were you participating in the porn at all? I did participate, but as a background actor, I like to say I had a small part in a porno, but, um, but yeah, um, I played prison inmates, bitch. Number two. Okay. I, was, I was wearing a, uh, an orange jumpsuit and sitting on the knee of like a 400 pound dude. <laughs> But uh, that, that was as far as it went. But I don't even think it made the final cut. It might be in the DVD extras. Nice. But, uh, yeah. But that was it. But um, but from that and from those experiences kind of came this um, um, gonzo persona that I had, like, um, for nerve initially, going out, trying new stuff. Like, I, you know, they sent me to orgies. They sent me to sex parties. They sent me to, um, like dungeons dominatrixes you know all that kind of stuff and did you come up with the places where to go or they someone picked no you? I, I didn't and and I, I think that was kind of like part of the winning formula is that i often i was begrudgingly going right you know? so so I, I was going under duress because it's you know some guy living out his fantasies isn't as funny as True. some dude having to do something that's going to make him uncomfortable and it was uncomfortable i was 24 and really inexperienced. I hadn't had a one night stand even. I hadn't I hadn't done a bunch of normal things that, that most people w- w- maybe would have done by that age. I was being thrown in at the deep end, which was comedy gold a lot of the time. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So, so keep going, what happened after that? Well, after that, you know, there was a kind of a, a, a sort of um, diaspora of the editorial staff that went to different magazines, you know, um, I think Emily Nussbaum went to New York magazine and Genevieve Field went to Glamour magazine and they still called on me from time to time. So um, that's when I realized that I could maybe have a, a career as a freelance writer, you know, which suited me to the ground because you started off talking about having a lifestyle where you can be on the beach or, do where it can be kind of like completely untethered. Um, yeah. And, um, and I, I really coveted that lifestyle and, and within a relatively short period of time, I had it. And back then you used to be able to get paid quite a lot of money for magazine articles, especially if you were writing features. So I was, I was writing features for men's health, uh, glamor, New York magazine. And I only really needed to write a handful of articles per year to, to stay afloat. Um, wow, I didn't realize the pay was that good. Oh, yes. Yeah, so some articles were paying, you know, $3 a word and, you know, so maybe nine wow. grand an article, you know, so, Crazy. so yeah. it's pretty well. And I was having fun doing it. Right. So, so, um, although what I didn't do uh, was leave New York. And that's probably what I should have done, maybe, um, mm-hmm. because like earning that kind of money and living somewhere cheap, um, right. especially 16, 17, 18 years ago when there were plenty of uh, places on the, on the planet that hadn't blown up yet that are now like big digital nomad uh, destination, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of wish I did it before, but I already felt pretty untethered, like being 24, having a good income or 25 and like being footloose and fancy free. It was yeah. the technology. I, mean, I, 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 moved to, I moved to New York in 2012, 2011 or something. Yeah. Um, just because I was like, you know, I want to live in New York. That's, uh, it was kind of a dream I always had growing up in LA. Um, and I wanted to experience, you know, that life. So I was kind of doing the back and forth LA, New York thing, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure, I mean, in, in terms of being like a young single guy and having adventures like New York city is kind of bar none, oh, but it's not cheap for sure. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. No, and it, and it was a lot of fun. It, you know, I had a, yeah, we, I, I did not waste too much time or too many opportunities there. It was really, it was really fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you were, you were writing the articles, you know, and living, living in the city. Um, yeah. And did that, did all of those kind of sexual experiences um, have a pretty big impact on like your dating life or your sexual appetite? Did it, you know, do you yeah. think it, kind of pushed you towards the extremes maybe what it did was give me an opportunity to sort of like do things and experience things that maybe i would have been a bit embarrassed to say that i wanted to try it and i'm like well i'm doing it for work you right. know you you had, you had this amazing alibi like um <laughs> uh, you know i remember once we went to a model there was a big after party for this model agency was was uh throwing and um me and some friends were given tickets to go. And the, and the idea was like, I had to try out cheesy pickup lines on models. Right. <laughs> okay. and, um, and the models, I had no, no idea, of course. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. And I wouldn't have done that ordinarily, uh-huh. you know? um, but, but, you know, having this little push, this little nudge, like, Hey, by Friday, we want 2000 words on how you got slapped by Heidi Klum or whatever. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so, you know, it, it was fun stuff like that stuff that I would be probably too shy to do I right. was being pushed. I had an excuse to do it. It's my living to do it. You know? Yeah. I had a similar experience kind of getting involved with, um, dating coaching and, you know, I was pushed, um, uh, by, I, I went to different dating workshops and seminars and they had us do what I now call social freedom exercises, where they're like, you know, you have this fear of approaching a woman or you just have this fear of looking bad or looking like an idiot. So here's some exercises you can do to, to make yourself, you know, intentionally, which is look, look foolish, which uh, I think they call it CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy or, or something like that. Um, you know, so I do crazy stuff. Like I'd lie down on a sidewalk, you know, on a Manhattan street, like I was dead for like a minute and, you know, people are, people are calling 911. Then you just get up and you walk away. Like, you know, or you, you go up to a couple and you start asking them questions about, you know, where you can find a good Valentine's gift for your girlfriend. Then you start picking your nose and, right. you know, wipe it on your shirt. And then you attempt to shake their hand at like just stupid shit like that. Um, <laughs> just funny. to push your boundaries and your comfort zone. And then you realize like, it's not that big of a deal. No one really gives a shit about you. They're too worried about themselves. Right. Um, so a lot of these social fears or fears of looking like an idiot are, are really just that they're, you know, illogical things that don't really matter. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, it sounds like that was a similar experience for you that I had. I just had it in a, in a different way. Um, you know, kind of going through this personal growth journey and, and being pushed to do some of those things to get over my, you know, fear of women and fear of rejection. Mm, right. Yeah. 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 No, it's funny you mentioned CBT because that was one of the pieces that I wrote, wrote for Nerve. Um, but CBT in that instance st- stood for cock and ball torture, <laughs> which is slightly uh, different. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a, it's a common menu item on Dominatrix's, uh, you know, list. Sounds painful. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> so the, um, did anything surprise you? Um, it, like what was your biggest kind of w- when you're going to those sex parties and, and doing all those crazy things, is there anything that stood out that was like totally shocking or memorable or surprising? Um, you know, I suppose what was most shocking was not necessarily the, um, um, the events themselves, it was often I needed an accomplice to bring to, to these things. And I was su- really surprised by how many, um, you know, what you might call civilians were totally up for coming along. Right. If they got invited, right? No, yeah. Like, sure. yeah. Hey, I've got a weird question. I have to go to this upscale um sex party in this fancy Manhattan hotel. I need a date. You don't have to do anything, but do you want, and they're like, yes, yes. Like- I can't, I had the same experience when I started going to sex parties, you know, back, you know, mid 2000s, I think, no, 2012, whatever. But I would invite totally like what I thought were vanilla random girls that I had, you know, met at a bar or even met on Tinder of like, Hey, totally crazy invite. 
not expecting you to say yes to this one, but you want to go to a, a weekend sex party in Vegas? And they're like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. And <laughs> I was, I was shocked by that. I, and that I started going to sex parties all the time. It was like a, you know, swingers lifestyle sort of events. Um, there's a huge community of those people in SoCal and Vegas. And I was going to these things like every weekend and bringing different girls and having an amazing time. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think it's, um, when you know sub i fell into being a sort of like uh gatekeeper to all kinds of different unknown worlds right because mm. i'm like um i think that's an attractive quality when you when you're a sort of party wizard where you could be like hey i can make this happen uh this yeah. weekend if you're interested like if that if that appeals to you and yeah and, you know, every once in a while, some be like, oh, that's not for me. But more often than not, people are like, yeah, I'll check that out. Even if they don't do anything and they're just curious, um, you know. Um, yeah. So and I think you have a, a, you know, your personality and just you have a very trustable kind of, you know, easygoing sort of guide to invite them to that. You know, like, yeah. you're like, yeah, no pressure. I'm going to go if you want to come. Great. Yeah. And most of the invitations that girls are getting are probably pretty lame and mundane if they're single, right? Yeah. They're probably getting a lot of boring date invitations with boring guys they meet online. And, yeah. you know, here comes here comes you with an invitation to a swingers party. And they're like, yeah, I'm not doing anything. Let's check it out. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah. So so it's uh yeah, that that was that was definitely um um the, the most surprising thing, but the, the, I mean, the, uh, some of the more surprising things is just the amount of money people would spend to um, facilitate to scratch the rich that they had for their particular mm -hmm. fetish, right? So, one thing um, I um, met with this woman named the Baroness um, in the East Village, and she was like, she's the latex queen. I mean, I don't need to qualify it. She is the latex queen, and um, one of the services she she provided was this thing called the suck bed, which was a sort of like rubber pencil case that she would zip people up into and they'd have a snorkel to breathe you know and then she'd turn on a vacuum and it would basically shrink wrap them in rubber as they're lying on the floor breathing through this kind of tube and they would just be there like that for five six seven hours at a time 250 dollars an hour what yeah i mean just insane kind of money you just don't move and you breathe through a snorkel yeah and sometimes yeah. you would like rub an ice cube over your latex body you're like han solo frozen in carbonite but it's just like a rubber skin that you're in wow. yeah um you know so i'm in the wrong business yeah no <laughs> so, so you know um it kind of all that stuff kind of gave me an appreciation kind of for like um how s mostly simple my tastes are and if they're not simple they're certainly not expensive um so um but it's interesting um you know just seeing where where commerce meets um sexuality you know and yeah. th th there are some people that are uh, uh into financial domination right where they never actually have any kind of physical contact with the person but they just drain their bank account and they they it's their fetish to be taken for you know a thousand dollar pair of shoes or whatever it might be you know i recently was talking to my little brother uh, and he told me that he had one of his former uh, high school teachers um, emailed him and a bunch of his friends out of the blue um, from his email address. And it was a dominatrix basically emailing on his behalf saying, I've got, you know, Mr. Mr. Jones tied up and uh, I need your PayPal because I'm going to send you, you know, a hundred bucks and, and then I'm going to beat him. And then they he, basically, my brother is just collecting hundred dollar increments from this guy over the course of like months, and not, well, not just him, but a lot of his buddies that went to the same high school. And it was all this weird, like as you as you called it, um, yeah. financial cup holding yeah. sort of thing. Um, so <laughs> my brother tried to sign him up for my dating advice, <laughs> which seems like he could use, but. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing! Yeah, that's yeah, um, yeah. I, that, that that's so gregarious on the part of the dominatrix that she's you know she's spreading the wealth among all these <laughs> other people. <laughs> that's so weird. 
Wow, that's the most interesting re- reallocation money that I've I've ever heard of. That's amazing. It's so yeah. weird. Yeah, he's yeah. like, maybe I can get him to send you some money too. I'm like, yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah. He didn't, unfortunately, wow. but I was like, better to have him as a client. So he stopped sending the money and maybe, you know, yeah. fixes this sort of weird fetish that's going to drain his, because he's a high school teacher. The guy doesn't have money to send, you know? Right, right. Yeah. My goodness. Wow. Crazy. Yeah, we're... Well, uh, <laughs> People are interesting is my overall take after, after years of, of, you know, doing this kind of thing. Right. So how did that, how did all this um, lead into, you know, what were your relationships like as, as you got older and progressed? Um, You know, obviously now I, I think everyone listening or watching would, would guess that you're not really the monogamous sort of, you know, <laughs> lifestyle. Um, well, actually, and- Funny enough, and the reason why I asked is because for the longest time, um, I was living an extremely sort of open, crazy, non-monogamous lifestyle until recently um, with Maria, who you met. And um, and I can maybe share about my, how I kind of transitioned or whatever, but I'm curious about you. Yeah, it's funny you mention it, Robbie, because actually while I was doing all that crazy stuff, I was... Uh, I'm monogamous. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, um, and so um, what was really interesting and kind of what my first book was about was like, even though I was doing all this kind of stuff for, for money, I was ha- having all these weird, crazy sexual escapades. It wasn't my bag. You know, like, like my, when I was off the clock, I was just like a normal dude. And then like once a week, I'd go and do something crazy and right. write about it, right? So, um, um, so, um, that, that was really interesting. Um, and then, um, my, the woman that ended up becoming my wife, um, she read my book or she said she read my book and then she, um, told me we were having, we were kind of already decided we were going to move in together. And then one day we were talking on the phone. She told me about the guy that she'd fucked the night before. And I was just like, wait, we're in a relationship. And she's just like, yeah, but I read your book. Like, you're supposed to be a crazy guy. It does all this crazy stuff. And I'm like, no, man. Like, the point of the (laughs) book was, that's not really who I am. I just do that for a job. It's called working stiff. It's what I do for my job, you know? So you guys are in, like, a normal monogamous relationship. She reads (laughs) the book, and then... Yeah, yeah, it was was early on. It was long distance, right? So, um, So in the end... Which she was like, well, I'm kind of disappointed because I, I imagine my next, my next relationship, I wanted to try something different, maybe try something that was open, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I said, well, listen, it's not really my bag, but if you give me six months to get used to the idea, I'll, then I'll try on. And, you know, we ended up living together. We fell in love. We, all that stuff. We ended up getting married actually. And then I was like, you know what, if you want to, if you want to do that, you absolutely can. Um, I always thought that she was going to be the one who took advantage of it because she was cute. She's athletic. You know, she's really friendly and smart and sexual. And I just said to myself, why am I trying to cut off this woman's, uh, she's in her prime. She's 20, yeah. you know, like, well, why should I be like, Oh, I don't want you to sleep with other people. You know, like, so, and then ironically, because I was a travel, I kind of transitioned into writing about travel and I was like, zipping around the world the whole time i ended up being the person who um took advantage of it initially got it you know yeah so so i ended up um i was sort of talked into being non-monogamous and then i i was like oh what was i worried about this is actually a great fit for me you know right and then and then we had an eight-year marriage that was that was pretty um that was very open you know and then in the, at the end of that marriage, she was like, you know what? I think I'm, I'm veering towards the more of the monogamy thing. And I was like, well, I don't think I'm done fucking with this stuff. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, and then that was the sort of split. But so, yes. Yeah, so, so she wanted to open it up and then you did. And then eventually she wanted to. Yeah. But what what yeah. was funny was, you know, the only reason she she broached the subject of being open is, is because she'd read and I have to say kind of misunderstood the point of my book, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. So, so, so it was really interesting, but um, you know, I stayed on this path 
of being a, a non-monogamous and then and she ended up um having a kid with a guy and they have like um you know a, a normal or normative monogamous uh, relationship as far as mm-hmm. i know yeah and what what was your sort of like uh ideal or dream fantasy lifestyle i think you know at least for mine i grew up um in a very sort of leave it to beaver type family um you know parents have been married for 40 years now um all my you know two grandparents two sets of grandparents together all my aunts and uncles never a divorce in the family so it was like just perfect you know family no 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 anything out of the ordinary you know very vanilla yeah. Um, and for whatever reason, you know, me and my sisters and, and brother all like became like party animals. Right. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I spent all of my thirties just, you know, having crazy wild sexual adventures and devoting all of my time, money and resources to having more. Um, so I had this huge appetite to, to go out and, you know, fulfill that or scratch that itch, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, did, was that, did you have anything similar to that or, or were you more just like, eh, whatever, you know, I'm doing it for work. No, I mean, uh, no, I grew up my family very close, you know, very similar sounding to yours. You know, mm-hmm. they, they were very social. They, they like to, you know, socialize and, and go out to, I mean, I don't know what they got up to, to be honest, but you know, as far as I could tell, they were, they were very stable, you know, they'd still together now, you know, um, but they were, um, they were very encouraging for me to sort of, um, you know, follow my drill, like think bigger and do what I wanted to do and stuff like that, which was probably a little bit different from how some of my friends in suburban England were brought yeah. up, you know? So, um, so that definitely stuck with me, but it, it didn't come from a, a play. Like it was, this wasn't nothing. This wasn't anything that I really, um, you know, I didn't model my behavior on them, like, um, other than that, that, I mean, I think they're hedonistic when it comes to food and drinks and having a good time, it's, you know, but, but, um, and, you know, I, I don't know, like, they, we really, I don't know, we used to vacation together in, a lot and, and like, I don't know, having a life that was felt more like a vacation than, uh, a, a, like a constant vacation w- was probably their most lasting legacy on me, you know, and that's how I feel like I, you know, and, you know, um, and, and luck, and, you know, that that's how it is right now. Like I can, I, I live in like you, I live in Airbnbs for the most part. Um, um, I don't have a lot in the way of possessions. Um, and, um, but I'm just like having a good time all the time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then and, and when it's, when it starts to get less cute, you know, um, then, and I guess I won't do it as much, but I feel like there's plenty more fun to be mined before I hang it up, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah for sure. It's um, I like to say I want a lifestyle where I get to do what I want, when I want with who I want to, wherever I want to, you know, right. that's kind of like the ultimate idea of, of freedom in my mind. Um, yeah. How about kids for you? Not for you. Don't know. Uh, d- no, I do know. I had a sex to me. Oh, that's right. Okay. You yeah. didn't tell me that. My bad. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Look at that. We meet on the beach and I tell you all the <laughs> operations I've had on, on my nether regions. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I, I definitely did not um, uh, want, it's just not something that's occurred to me. Uh, mm. Yeah. I could I could list off 50 reasons why it's not for me, but, um, but yeah, but I mean, of course, if you were a sexual person and you like sex, then, you know, every time you hook up with someone to some extent, it's like, you know, you know, it's like rolling the dice. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I didn't want the thing that I love to do the most result in the outcome that I desired the least. Right. Right. So I thought it was up to me to take responsibility um, to make sure that that didn't happen, you know, yeah. and you can still do that if you are not sure if you want kids, you know, you can, I didn't free bank and freeze my sperm, mm-hmm. you know, you, you can do that. Um, and that's pretty good. And then you can be really deliberate if you want a family at some point in the future. But I, I was so adamant that I didn't, um, mm-hmm. I, I felt pretty good about having, um, the operation. It was very, 
it was painless and it was really inexpensive um and, and it's, uh, uh, it, it's reversible as well isn't it it is but i think it's one of those things you should never really enter into thinking that one day you'll kind of reverse it i mean it is right it's expensive it's a much more complicated uh procedure than having it done in the first place uh-huh. you know? um and um the and, the and the longer you go without it being reversed like the 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 less likely it is to be successful gotcha you know so so it's really something you want to be pretty sure of or you bank and then you do it and then you've got all your options open got you it. Know? i'm a big mm-hmm. advocate of it i th- think it's a you know for, for people that don't don't want to accidentally have a baby which should be most people um right. it's a smart move for sure yeah so do you have any advice for a guy who might be listening to this um wants to have a crazier sort of sexual lifestyle, wants to kind of tackle some of those uh, sex bucket activities um, and isn't sure how to kind of go about it or get into it. Yeah, I think, you know, I, it, this is so corny and hackneyed, but really that my life started to change around and I started to get into all the hijinks that I wanted to get into, not the ones that my editors were telling me to do, but the things that I wanted to do. Um, once I really started to sort of feel comfortable in my own skin, which happened when I was about 31, you know, mm-hmm. um, and um, I sort of uh, took responsibility for getting in shape and I got, uh, I, I started to exercise and eat better and feel better and look better and feel more confident. You know, um, I also had, um, I had a hot wife um, who I could be completely open about, about my desires and what I wanted to do. And um felt accepted and stuff like that. And at that point, um, you know, you, you, you just sort of, um, you sort of realize what's great about you. Not to say that everything is, you, everyone has um, negative things, but like, but I was like, oh yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good at, people like me for these reasons and I like me for these reasons. I'm good at them and I should double down on them and I should own them. And I should be unapologetic about them. And then as soon as you do that and you internalize it, everyone can see it. Yeah. Everyone can see it. And it was like, the minute I did that, the world opened up. Mm -hmm. It it was crazy. Um, Yeah. I see that. For me, it was right around that same age too. Um, Yeah. And I tell a lot of the guys I work with that are in their mid twenties. I'm like, you just need to wait a few years and continue doing, you know, what you're doing. Um, any guy who comes to me at an early age, they're, they're usually pretty like savvy dudes in the first place um, yeah. to want to get involved and improve themselves. Um, and then just the maturity that comes along with like, you know, being a guy in their or in your early thirties, you kind of, you, you get some, you know, experience under your belt. Typically your career starts to formulate around that time. And I see most guys kind of kind of hit their stride around like the early thirties. For me, it was like 33. Um, it, it's then, funny. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned this because Brian, about my friend who you met on the, on the beach that same day, mm-hmm. um, you know, when we were 26, we went on a fishing trip with his dad and his dad's friend off the coast of New Jersey somewhere. And his dad went down below deck and then his, his buddy, John just came up to us, put an arm around each of us. And he was in his like mid to late fifties by that point. And he said, listen, guys, I got to tell you something. Stay single till you're at least 33. He's like, because at 33, things are going to happen. You're going to be, you're going to have more swagger. You're going to have more money. You're going to have, um, you're going to be able to date people who are younger and who are older than you. Like, you're going to become more interesting. You'll have done more things. Like, the key is to, like, not hang it up before you, um, you, you reach this point reach the potential. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and for men, you know, I think um, that as exactly as you've said, early thirties is when things start to pop off and you're like, Oh wow, I can look what I'm doing. This seems yeah. like, I, like if I went back in time and told the 22 year old me what my life was like, I think I was crazy, but you know, um, like it gets better, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, uh, yeah it's, you have money, you have the freedom, you know, you don't have a family. Um, yeah. And there's just so much awesome shit you can do. You yeah. know, once you kind of hit that stride and you'll stay in that sweet spot until you're like 45 or 50, if you stay in shape, yeah. you know, um, 
as long and if you look good, you can date girl. If you if your thing is to date girls in their early twenties, I mean, you can do that until you're, you know, significantly older as long as you stay in good shape and remain relevant. Right. Um, and um, I think for women, they they kind of hit their that sweet spot a lot earlier, kind of like you know from twenty twenty to like twenty eight twenty nine for a mm-hmm. lot of them. I think it's just difference in in our biology. I would guess. I mean, obviously, you know there's a lot of women who remain awesome and hot and cool and bloom later too. Um, but just the access, I, I saw this crazy graph. It's like male access to pussy versus female access to dick by age. And oh. <laughs> I'll post it in, in the video. I'll send you a thing. And, and it, it shows like 33 to like 48 for guys is like top of the, of the access, right. you know, the Y and X access. And for women, it's like, I think 20 till 27 or something right and you have this marriage zone where you know most most people get married in like their late 20s yeah so women are kind of tapering off with their access to dick at that point and they're like all right let's start a family and and let me capitalize on you know my good looks whereas guys haven't even hit that that tipping point yet yeah no it's i think there might be some truth to that yeah it's, it's interesting yeah um but you, you know, it's it's just, um, but, but no, no, nobody really. It, it's funny, like you, you, you. Uh, I remember again, not to, to mention my friend again. We've been friends for a long time. When we were on the one you met on the beach, mm-hmm. um, we were at a, a party once, and this is when I was writing that column that I did it for science, and um, we were at this party at his house. There was probably a hundred people there, and this famous photographer named Spencer Tunick showed up. And he's famous for doing these big portraits of like hundreds of people that are all naked. Right. So, so he was like, do you want me to take a picture? And then like half the people at the party just got naked and I didn't. Right. Cause I was, even though I was a sex person for a job, I was scared and worried. And I was like, Oh, I feel like I'm not in shape and blah, blah, blah. Uh-huh. And then Brian says to me, he's like, Hey man, he's like, you're 26. Every year you get older, you're going to look worse. Like you're aging. It's happening you know mm-hmm. um, and then um, but still that wasn't enough to provoke me into joining everyone and taking my clothes off but i'm gl- i'm i'm glad to say that he was wrong on, on that front you know right. that y- you are in charge um and, and that's another one of the lessons i've learned from you know you can reinvent you can improve you can if you set your mind to something you can make it happen and, and you can ensure that your best days are ahead um where there's all this pressure you know, especially when in a, in a group of dudes, some of them start getting married and they start looking at you like, hey, man, it's not going to be so cute in a year or two from now. You know, like um, mm. and I feel like there's a little bit of pressure to sort of, um, you know, yeah. And, and, and to sort of like um, hang it up. Right. But, but yeah, but if you as you say, if you stay in shape and you stay relevant and um, and you stay a good person, um then um then then you needn't really do everything on the same timeline that everybody else is doing yeah right yeah and you had a a pretty cool um physique transformation um you know i'll post the before and after if that's cool i think you already have it online i mean i insist i want everyone (laughs) to do that shit yeah and um you were able to accomplish that in like a month right which is 28 days yeah yeah yeah. Anything, what, what are kind of your secrets for, you know, you're a guy, you're living the nomadic lifestyle. How yeah. do you, you know, how do you maintain your physique or did you find it? What, one thing that I found, I'm curious if you found the same, it's like kind of the, the, the in shape, stay in shape, like the rich stay rich or get, yeah. get richer. And if yeah. you're out of shape, it takes so much energy to get into shape. But once you do, it's easy to stay there. In my yeah. Experience. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, like, I owe it all to my, uh, who became my good friend, Ingo Okafor, who um, is, is like, uh, just a, an amazing dude. He's, like, more than a trainer. He's, like, a life coach and a mentor. And um, and he, he looked at me, and I've, I've been fucking with fitness for a while, writing for Men's Health. And, um, and, he, and, and he said, yeah, we can get you, just do everything I say. We can get you where you want to be in, in 28 days. And I was like, I want to be lean and like Brad Pitt and fight club. And he's like, mm-hmm. we can do that. And fuck me. He did like wow. got me in that kind of shape in 28 days. I lost 18 pounds. Um, 
which is insane. Um, but but you said, you know, you talked about the sustainability of being in shape. Um, and one of the many, many, many nuggets of advice that you gave me was that you should always be never more than two to three weeks away from the best you can ever look, right? Mm -hmm. So you can slip, you can have a few weeks off, or, you know, you can do whatever if you really want to, but like never let yourself get beyond like if one you're in trouble once you're like months away from looking how you want to look because that seems daunting and it seems yeah. like oh my god and then it's already may and you're like oh if i fucking throw every i might be beach ready by like fucking labor day like that's no good right so so one of his one of his um sayings is summer is coming like a perversion of the, of, of game of thrones winter's going right summer's coming. yeah and he's like, look, it's always coming. It's right around the corner. And especially for guys like you and I, Robbie, like we, we chase summer, right? We're, yeah, we're always in summer. Yeah. So, so, um, so that's, I think um, in, in the Northeast or in Northern Europe where I'm from, we have this, uh, you know, like all bets are off from like October through, you know, we don't wake up about it until like April, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's a bad way to live. You're always in this boom bust sort of thing. So it's it's almost like being mobile and living in places where it's hot and you're not going to be wearing much clothes. You, you're going to be at the beach is this sort of constant reminder. Like I need to sort of like be in fairly good shape, you know. Um, in addition to that, um, I, I don't I don't suggest that this is what works for me. Um, I, I limit carbs. I um, only really drink on the weekend and even then it's not very much. Um, and um, I try and create a caloric deficit of 1000 calories per day, um, which is probably a little higher than they suggest, but I find it works for me. Um, I wear a Fitbit. This yeah. is super handy. Um, I use a food logging app called Chronometer and, and mm -hmm. Fitbit and Chronometer talk to one another. So I, I can easily at a glance see um, see, see how, how, how much of a deficit I'm working with. Right. I, I generally, and that's so important to, to track, you know, they say that you, what you, what you don't track or measure, you can't improve. And right. I really believe that to be true. Absolutely. So having that and the, having the ease that those things integrate with each other and it doesn't require a ton of effort on your part. Right. Um, you know, cause I also track my food every day, but I don't have the, uh, the chronometer or whatever I have my phone tracks my steps in a, in a bit and I track my exercises but it's a little yeah. bit laborious so I might yeah. uh, I mean and, and even with with the best ones then not, not, nothing could be like 100% accurate no I think well I mean uh, I can imagine a wearable in the future that actually goes in your stomach and can give you an a very accurate um accounting of calories burned and then uh, calories expended and you know exactly but I think <laughs> it's been like instrumental in mm -hmm in helping me keep that um, deficit, you know? Um, I, I try and eat like at least a gram of protein per pound of body weight. For, so for me, that's about 140 grams of protein a day, which really isn't that difficult. You can, even if you're vegetarian, it's, that's relatively easy to do. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I um, that's the way. How I, often do you, do you work out and what's your typical? Oh yeah, we didn't talk about the workout part. Um, 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 well, every day. Okay. Uh, I, I, well, first of all, I make sure that I walk at least 15,000 steps a day, mm -hmm. right? Um, and walking is really good for me and for fat loss. And there's plenty of studies that show why, you know, um, um, it's not the most like time, uh, time effective way to lose calories, but it's, it's probably, it, it's, it's, um, th there's all kinds of reasons why it's good for fat loss in particular. Right. Right. Uh, Let's so say steady, I, long, long, steady state, you know, non-intensive oh, yeah, yeah. cardio, right. Is great for fat loss. And it, yeah, it's great. And, it, and, and if like you or I, and we do a lot of our business on the phone, it's a great opportunity to be like talking and Perfect. chatting yeah. and, and that's really good. Um, so I do a lot of that. And then I like to do, you know, push, pull, legs, push, pull. So that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, and yeah, and my workout is like 45 minutes each day. Um, and, and that's it. And I, you know, when I, when I get an Airbnb, uh, um, hopefully there's access to a gym or access to workout equipment in the place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, I try and do it. Um, and, I'm, and I, I enjoy it. And I think that's the, the, the biggest key is to really 
enjoy working out and if you don't initially you sort of have to fake it till you make it you totally know? agree if you, you start to you start to really enjoy it like i used to hate going to the gym um and now you know because i consistently go every other day yeah. um you know i do legs and back and buys chest and tries and then um shoulders you know yeah. and just repeat that and i think it's also important to to trick your body every once in a while and switch you know, the exercises you're doing and, and that stuff. And I've got a guy that helps me, but now if I don't go to the gym, I like, you know, then I feel bad. But yeah. if I, if I quit for like a month, it's so hard to get back into it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, the trick is to, to, to never let it, um, you know, take, take a few days off, take a week off. But yeah. Don't go. More than that because, I uh, love what, what your friend said, or your trainer said that always be two weeks away from ideal yeah. shape. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah, that's yeah. such a, a great mentality to have. Well, he, he's just a, a great, I mean, like, he's a dude. I mean, he's just amazing. He, he, um, he'd he never want, worn a pair of boxing gloves until he was 30 years old. And then he saw somebody training for the Golden Gloves. He trained and he won, not one year, but two years running. At, <laughs> at 31 and at 32, he'd never boxed before in his life. And he became the heavyweight Golden Gloves champion. Twice. Oh, my God. Crazy. So. Yeah, his name's Ingo Okafor. He's a ma- NGO. Um, he's, he's very easy to find. And, and he's just like, he's an awesome guy. And, mm-hmm. and it's, you know, he just had, I, th- I think also the other key to getting and staying in shape is having faith that by doing what you do constantly every day, y- you'll get where you're going. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's the, the, the tough part about working out and, you know, building physique is – the results are anything but instantaneous, right? You know, what you're doing now isn't really going to, going to show up until like a month down the road, a lot of the time. Right. So reminding yourself of that and having like just the faith to stay with it mm-hmm. without that instant gratification is, is you know, quite difficult. And, and the reverse yeah. is also true, right? You eat a burger today. It's just like, yeah, whatever. It's an extra burger, extra fries, tons of ketchup with sugar. It's like, it's not yeah. going to matter today, but it's going to matter down the road. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I, and I think one, one you know, um, I, I always feel like um, when I'm, when I'm trying to like do something quickly in, a, in an extreme way, then I'm really serious about macros. You know, mm-hmm. once you're like where you want to be, you can just look, I, I find it's, it's, you can just look at cat. You can kind of splurge and have a burger and fries, but you, you just look at the, the uh, calories um, and not really look at the macros. Right. That's a, like it, it, it. So you're like, I'm already in great shape. I can eat a burger and eat light the rest of the day, and I'm good. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You can even eat a, a few days of shit, and no yeah, deal. you get back to it. So one other sort of change of topic, real fast. Um, so you you're lived all over the place, U.S. Obviously from the U.K. Um, I know yeah. you're going to Thailand next. Yeah. But what What are your recommendations, and maybe some places to avoid as far as the digital nomad lifestyle of a single guy? Um, well, I haven't really had too many bad experiences, you know, um, mm-hmm. I will say, um, um, I learned a few lessons in Mexico, um, which is, I mean, the, the, the Mayan Riviera is not cheap, certainly not by Mexican standards. And, um, I was probably, um, I was living a little too lavish. I mean, you saw one of the places I was staying at. I, yeah. I got it for me and it was like a townhouse with like a roof deck and two bedrooms and a plunge pool. And I probably didn't need to, um, to go quite so big. And I probably didn't need to rent a car, you know, mm-hmm. um, um, certainly not an expensive one that I did, you know, like, so, so, um, you know, I think, I think in the future, the places that I'll go to, um, will be like less touristy, but still have the infrastructure I need to do what i need to do so what that really boils down to obviously is like super fast wi-fi um and uh it it was never a problem in mexico but it was just um there were some hacks that i just i didn't really think about until i got down there which you know i was like well i need a car because i want to cook for myself because i want to be in control of what i eat um so how am i going to go back and forth in the supermarket if i only have a bicycle or a moped you know Mm-hmm. Uh, and then friends were like, well, you go to the supermarket on your bike and then you um, rent a taxi, load up the taxi and then follow the taxi back to your place and then load it there. And that's how it works. And you save a thousand dollars a month. And I was like, oh, I'm so stupid. I didn't <laughs> think of that, you know, um, 
so so yeah so i would stay away from um that and then you know you you got to be in a time zone that um you can live with like so when i go to thailand i'm going to be there from um eight um you know, I'm going to be working from like maybe, sorry, 10 p.m. to kind of 6 a.m. if I want to stay on East Coast time. Yeah. Which, um, you know, which is, uh, you know, I think I can do it. I tell myself that I'm good at working at night. So, but, you know, I'm going to have to see if um, I can really um, do that without going crazy. So, um, but I have, experiment. yeah, I know. I haven't, got, I haven't gone to any places that I was like, oh, I'd stay away from here. I mean, like, um, you know, anywhere where, where you can't really communicate properly. And I really don't, I speak a tiny bit of Spanish, but not very much. You end up feeling like a, a meatball. And then like, if you're trying to chat up people, you're trying to introduce yourself and make conversations with people and you, and you really have the vocabulary of a three-year-old, you know, it's tough and you can't, yeah. and you're like, Oh God, I sound like an idiot. I, you know? And, um, and for me, um, so, you know, some people can get by that, I suppose, if you're like, um, you know, like, like some sort of Adonis type characters, like 6'3", you can, you can skate by on your looks alone. But I feel like a, a lot of what I have is what I have to say. And if you're robbed of that, then right. you're sort of at a big disadvantage, you know? For sure. Yeah, that's important. Really important point is you have to go somewhere to play into your strengths. And if if you have the gift of gab, as you do and you remove that from your arsenal, it's going to be that much more difficult. And yeah. if you're, if you're this Adonis guy listening and you know, you're not the best conversation conversationalist, but you're in great shape and you're big and you're strong, like, yeah, like, go somewhere where, you know, it doesn't matter and you can just hang out on the beach. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's true. But you know, it's, um, it's for the same reason I don't really like clubs because it's, especially when they're super loud and, you know, I like to think that, um, you know, if, if, if I'm in any way amusing, it's because there's like nuance and kind of like subtlety to what I'm saying in my jokes, if they mm -hmm. are, jokes, you know, and all of that shit gets lost. If you're like, Hey, I said, you know, like if you're yelling in someone's ear um, in a nightclub, you know, and besides I'm, I'm aged out of clubs quite a while ago. Um, but, um, but yeah, but I was never a fan even when I was younger because it, it didn't, as you say, it, it, it didn't allow me to foster my strengths. Sure. Yeah. Well, Grant, it's been amazing. I'm um, so glad I got to hear your story. Um, you know, I was always curious. So it was, it was fun to, to fill in the, the missing details, you know, yeah. from what we discussed in our other conversations on the beach and whatnot. Um, where can people listening, um, you know, find your work or, you know, get a hold of you if they want to or anything like that. And that's up to you, obviously, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, um, if, if you go to, um, you can search by contributor on menshealth.com or vice.com. And that's probably the, you know, where most of the things I've written um, um, exist. So that's just I'll post a link to a bunch of the articles because I, I binge read them. Um, you know, when you sent me them, they're all incredibly fascinating. So I highly recommend anyone oh. listening to check those out. Hey, you know what I'd like to do next time? I'd love to turn the tables and we'll do like a Robbie being interviewed. Uh, oh, uh, dude, that'd be awesome. I've been yeah. actually wanting to do that. Um, okay. Yeah, because if, if you trust me to want to ask the right questions, I'd, I'd love to. I think you're the perfect man for the job. Perfect. Let's do it. All right. So, yeah, guys, stay tuned for that. And um, as always, if you want some very specific strategies on what you can do to improve your dating life and get out there even the, in the midst of this pandemic, stop using online dating and, and being a, a lazy wanker and start approaching women, <laughs> get off your ass, go to innerconfidence.com, uh, get the, the day game guide, listen to these other podcasts, leave a review if you like the show, tell your friends to listen. Um, you know, try to put this content out there. So it makes a difference for people. So Grant, thanks so much for coming on and, uh, and giving everyone your ultimate awesome wisdom. <laughs> very, very wise. People always say that. <laughs> um, but yeah. Cool, man. Cool, brother. Thanks for listening. If you want more, go to innerconfidence.com and don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for the latest episodes.